If you want to see change within your own organization, within your church, you go to the lead pastor and say, look, I know that this is the vision for our church. I know this is the direction where we're going. I have an idea on how to fulfill this mission. And you basically want to use their words, like exactly how they say it, to like demonstrate that this isn't about you. And it's not even about them, the lead pastor. It's about the organization. It's about the church and like the mission that we're all on together. Come into the light. Shadow. Congratulations! World's best cup of coffee. What is it? <gasps> Gaff tape. Welcome to Coffee and Gaff Tape. I am Nate Anderson from Resi, and this is Daniel Larson. Hey, guys. This podcast is designed for those in the world of production tech. You know, the people you never see in the spotlight wearing mostly black, whose Amazon cart consists of 16 rolls of gaff tape, three decimators, and three or four boxes of AA batteries. Are you signed into my Amazon account? Maybe. Don't forget those Everlast boxing gloves for the pastor's teaching illustration. Ooh. Come on. You know that happens, which is also my self-made segue for this quick reminder. Hit. Uh-huh. See what you did there. I'm really sorry, guys. You can just turn off the <laughs> podcast now. Hit subscribe. Share the show with your friends and coworkers and volunteers. This podcast is for the production tech community, and we're counting on you guys to help us spread the word. That's right. All right. And it is time once again for our interview, our super creative name for when we get to sit down and talk tech booth life and real life with someone who wears mostly black and knows the difference between gain and volume. There is a huge difference. And as you heard in the show teaser, our guest today is YouTube sensation, production and communication tech guru, and founder of Pro Church Tools, Brady Shearer. And uh, we're really excited to have uh, Brady on. Oh, it's, yeah. a, it's a unique episode for us. We know it's a little bit of a departure from what we typically uh, deal with, which is mostly production tech. Um, but Brady deals a lot with that too. And he talks about communication tech. And we know that a lot of times uh, in the church, especially, people are wearing multiple hats and there's there's a lot going on. And so um, he's going to share just some great insights on um, all of that with the world of communication and uh, production and church and uh, a little bit about uh, what uh, the communication shift that he always speaks about, the biggest communication shift in the, in the in 500 years. Um, so we're really excited for it and uh, turn up those AirPods and we'll get right into it. Here we go. All right, guys, we are here with Brady Shear. Brady, thank you so much for joining us. We truly, truly appreciate you being here. Uh, it's awesome and a huge honor. So uh, we're going to jump right into the questions. And the first one out of the gate, like we ask everyone on the show, who is Brady Shear? Well, sure thing. Great to be here, gentlemen. Uh, like you said, name's Brady. I live in Niagara on the Lake. I run a company called Pro Church Tools. We've got a team of about uh, 15. And the way we like to describe what we do is we're here to help churches navigate the biggest communication shift in 500 years. So on a product side, we run a software company that has a church giving, web, social, CHMS elements to it. Uh, perhaps what we're best known for, though, is uh, the free content that we give away. So we've been podcasting since, I think, uh, 2014, YouTubing since 2013. Blogging was kind of how we got our start back in the day when blogging was kind of the foremost important kind of content you could publish online. And uh, yeah, started in my one bedroom apartment as a student in Bible college. And fast forward to today, you know, we've got thousands of church customers around the world. And like I said, a team of about 15 and a couple different locations, one here in Canada and another in the States. Nice. Awesome. That's awesome. Brady. Just taking it back here. Uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about how you are doing what you're doing now. How did you end up in the shadows of church production and church communication? So I mentioned Bible college. I went to Bible college to be a student pastor. That was the the, the dream. I kind of got connected to church in a real way. Grew up in a Christian home, but where faith became my own was in youth group. I started going to this Pentecostal uh, student ministry as a kid. It was called Impact Youth. Our logo was in Impact font. So yes. relevant. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I got into music there and, you know, I, I looked up to my youth pastor so much and I was like, man, it'd be so cool to be a youth pastor myself. And so I got really into theology, applied for Bible college, moved across the country with my a girlfriend. She was attending as well. Now wife and did my four year degree program, got my degree in student ministry 
and theology. It was in my second year, I was hired on as a paid intern at a new church plant as their media director. And I had no real production or media skills at the time. My lead pastor saw something in me. We're still great friends to this day. He really believed that I could pick up skills quickly and that I had a future in this. So he basically put a DSLR in my hand. It was a Canon T3i a new MacBook, which was to me like the coolest thing ever. And he basically said, Hey, you're in charge of, you know, the social and the branding and the communication and the video, just go with it. So I started picking up these skills. The first thing I did was I watched this, um, city church video, uh, Judas church, and they had done this like tilt shift effect in one of their videos. And I was like, Oh, it's so cool. Everything looks like a miniature in this. That's kind of what the tilt shift effect does. It's like a time lapse yeah. with these weird blurs that make everything look like miniatures. Mm-hmm. And so basically what I did was I reverse engineered how to do that. And the first video I ever made was, recreating this tilt shift effect, which took me about four weeks. You know, the first time lapse didn't work. The second time lapse, the cops pulled me over or (laughs) pulled over to the side of the road. They're like, why are you filming all these cars? And I was like, it's for a church video. And it was like when I got pulled over in youth group in high school and they're like, why is it 3 a.m.? You're all over the road. I was like, what have you been drinking? I was like, nothing. I was at a youth retreat. I'm tired. I want to go home and sleep. They're like, I'm doing Red Bull. (laughs) Right. They just never believe these excuses. So, you know, some rocky beginnings, but I began learning these skills. And as I'm picking them up, I'm looking at my peers in Bible college and I'm in the youth program. So these friends of mine, they're going to be coming youth pastors in a couple of years, starting their own churches in rural Canada, getting picked up as worship pastors. And I can just kind of foresee this is around 2010, how important digital media is going to become in the coming decade. And perhaps uh, more relevantly, they're the ones that are going to be entrusted with it. Sure. Like mm. you're the worship pastor. Can you also do social? Cause you're younger than the rest of us. And so I was like, if I'm learning these skills, and they're going to be important to me. They're also going to be important to my friends and my peers. And so I start basically just teaching online everything that I'm learning as I go. And that was the inception of prochurchtools.com. Again, blogging, YouTube, podcast, teaching everything that I was learning because I figured, again, I I didn't have any pre-existing skills in this arena, but if I can pick these things up, so can you, and they're going to become increasingly important. So let's learn them together. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. So cool. So that's so interesting to me because like, it seems like it was a, and correct me if I'm wrong, like a gradual progression where pro church tools was kind of birthed out of this, like, Hey, like how, almost like this, like question of like, how can I help um, those around me learn how to do these things as well? And so it kind of leads into my next question. Like, when did you realize that this was going to become bigger than just you blogging every once in a while? Well, the secondary vein of kind of my pursuit of pro church tools was that I was living in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So a couple hockey fans here on this call, it sounds like home of the Oilers, the Ooh. city of champions. You haven't won a title since the nineties, <laughs> hey, drop the they, moniker. They have Gretzky and Messier at the same time. Sure. Again, like I was five, it's embarrassing. <laughs> Move on. Uh, the most Northern major metropolis on the continent. I am Canadian. I live in currently basically as far south as you can go in the country. That's not an accident. It's an overcorrection from living in Edmonton for four years. My (laughs) wife and I, we just could not take these eight month winters. They do not plow their roads there, guys. They just say like, good luck. You're probably in a four by four truck. No, I'm in Bible college. I'm in a 96 (laughs) Chevy Malibu with summer tires. And so I I truly had a traumatic experience living there, commuting every morning to drop my wife off at this life-sucking insurance job so that we could not go into debt to complete Bible college. Anyway, I kind of get sucked into this like idea of an online business that you can run from anywhere that doesn't require you to commute. And so I basically just kind of fell in love with this like entrepreneurial idea where the online world could be what facilitates this. You know, I I did not have any business expertise, still have very little except from like what's on the ground actually happening in my company. And so it was kind of this confluence of two ideas, like pro church tools being what I just described, but also like I realized I 
probably didn't have the relational bandwidth for full-time pastoral ministry, at least in a youth context. And that's because like, I'm just more of an introvert than an extrovert. Hmm. And again, looking at my peers around me, the ones that I knew were going to be great youth pastors were the ones that just like wanted to be hanging out with kids at all times. And I love students, but like I had a very short, again, bandwidth for that relational element where after a few hours, I just like needed my space. And so I kind of like foresaw it. I don't know if I'm actually going to make a great student pastor, but I'm good at teaching and I only want to work with churches. That's all I want. This could be perhaps the best situation for me and my unique giftings. And so that was basically what was driving the entrepreneurial side. And then there was, of course, this desire to serve churches and my love of digital media on the professional side. Those two together created really the perfect recipe for, you know, what eventually is what we have today. Hmm. Well, obviously, Pro Church Tools is huge. It's making a huge impact. Uh, if you could summarize this journey uh, maybe like, how does, what, what makes Brady get out of bed in the morning now, uh, when it comes to pro church tools and helping the local church, uh, from a communications aspect? I mean, I, I just, it's not lost on me how easy it is. Like, as we live through this massive communication shift to just kind of get used to it. It's like, this is just what everyday life is. You know, everything's relative to all people. And so it's very easy to just get used to like what your daily life looks like. But if we think about the platforms that exist today and how many are so pervasive in our daily lives. So whether that be Google, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat, Dropbox, Spotify, Airbnb, uh, Google maps. You know, I grew up using MapQuest. like, well, that's not a thing anymore. <laughs> um, like those platforms, none of them existed prior to 2005. Hmm. And like, I know that's 16 years ago, but in like global, economics, that's an instant. And yet like those are the companies that are driving like so much. Like I didn't mention Tesla as an example and yeah. how the automobile industry is being upended. Every single industry is being massively disrupted. And we're still in the very early stages of that. Uh, TikTok has been a huge just passion of mine over the last year or so, because it was really the first social platform that like I got on and I didn't get right away because I wasn't like in high school or like in my early twenties when I got on it. And it's really taken me like a year or two to truly grasp like what makes the platform unique and special. But what's been a fascinating kind of like side journey in that is seeing this new generation, Gen Z, they're going to be like the first generation that grows up like in a completely digital world, essentially, because like their earliest formative memory, sure, maybe they didn't have the digital world or social, but like it was like before they were five years old. Whereas my generation, like our generation, we're kind of the last ones that are kind of straddling like we remember, like I grew up with one of those phones that like you had to like turn with your hand yeah, like exactly. manually. Right. What are those called? Like a rotary phone? I don't even know. Like I actually had that in my house. Remember when your phone Not had to be attached to the wall? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Like the number of phone models that we've gone through in our lifetime, like I, probably half a dozen different phones where like the new model came on, you're like cordless. Right. Wow. <laughs> like we got to charge it on the base, but I could walk around the house. Right. Like I can play snake on this Nokia mobile device. This is amazing. And like, now we have computers in our pockets. So right. like when you actually take a step back, you evaluate how fast, how dramatic, how colossal this communication shift is. It comes with a lot of like, it's the change is tough. It's uncomfortable, but on the flip side, the opportunity that is there to take this timeless message of Jesus and the hope of Christ and share it through timely mediums is greater now than ever. And what we see usually in these early days of these communication shifts or really in the early days of any massive disruption is that's when the opportunity is the greatest. Yeah. You know, if I started pro church tools today in 2021 and did everything identically, I don't know if I would be able to make the same impact or achieve the same quote unquote success is when I started in 2011, mm. just because timing is so important. And like, I did not choose to be born in 1991. I had no control over that. I did not choose to be born in North America where like I've had so much opportunity with tech and, and that sort of thing. So I just try not to take it, take for granted, like the amount of opportunity that exists right now, how it won't always be this way. 
and how we have more ability to like affect life change on a global level than not hyper, not hyperbole, uh, hyperbole to say this, any generation that came before us. Yeah, sure. So when I think about that, like, it's just gratitude for being alive during this time, you know, to quote my countryman Drake, what a time to be alive. Let's go get it. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome, man. I love it. And I love, you know, the one, one thing I love to hear just over and over from you, Brady is like, how do we um, engage in this shift? How do we be a part of it? How do we not be reactionary to some of these things that we see happening around in the world around us? And how do we take hold of it and take it as an opportunity? Um, you know, what, what, what would you say, being at the beginning of this massive communication shift and, and especially even this past year, what does the future hold for churches? Well, I think hybrid ministry is probably going to cement itself in, in some capacity. The pandemic has basically served as an accelerator of what we were already seeing. And this kind of gets into just church attendance overall and, and how churches fulfill their mission, which to me is probably the most fascinating discussion because it's really the bedrock that inspires and motivates everything that we do. And for the last century, two centuries, we've required and demanded people to come to us to affect life change. And, you know, 18 months into a pandemic, don't hear me wrong. Like in-person ministry is vital. It's necessary and it can never be replaced, but we've been seeing a decline in church attendance since 2010 in a pretty dramatic way that we've really never seen in the prior 100 years in, in this continent anyway. And that does coincide quite neatly with the rise of digital platforms. Now, correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation, but I think there's something there. And so hybrid ministry, what I mean by that is finding ways again, to take the timeless message of Jesus and share it through timely mediums. And if you look at church budgets, we have invested the vast majority of our time, money, creative energy, volunteer resources into a one hour in-person event. Yeah. And <clears throat> part of me, I just don't really think that that's uh, necessarily a wise allocation of resources. Again, not to downplay the importance of in-person ministry, right. but if you just look at the allocation of funds, like it's greatly imbalanced. Mm -hmm. Now, right now in a pandemic, maybe where I am, where there's still lockdowns in effect, we are feeling the other side of that imbalance where we're not allowed to meet in person the way we wish. And so sure. it's kind of probably a little bit obtuse to hear me describe it that way. My hope is we come out of this and we can, pursue after a more balanced framework or balanced paradigm for ministry because Gen Z millennials, we just don't connect to the church in the same way as previous generations. We are a product of our environment. And so mm -hmm. I like to think of it as like waves in the ocean. You can be that person that like stands in front of the wave. You can yell at it. You know, you can say that I'm not going to be affected by this wave and you can let it crash over you and knock you over. Maybe the first one doesn't, but eventually they get big enough where you get knocked over or you can try to ride the wave like a surfer would. The wave is going in one direction. How can you go with that momentum, go with the inertia of the wave and use that to propel you forward in affecting life change? So again, like the mission of our churches said simply is to affect life change. There are many different ways to do that. And there are more ways to do that now than ever before. We can argue about like, should I engage in this method or should I engage in this one? And every church will differ. But I think that the more effective we can be, it's going to require us to embrace more avenues. And that, again, is that hybrid ministry uh, model that I mentioned. Yeah, I love it. I, I love the idea of just getting out of the paradigm, like you're mentioning, of the weekend service, the typical way that we think of church, especially, um, you know, our generation and the ones before us. And it seems like now we have this opportunity in the, this time where we can really def redefine what ministry opportunities look like and what outreach looks like and how we do that, which will be really cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. The church yeah. I used to work at, we, we would often say church as we know it ain't going to cut it. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, I feel like that's what you're talking about here, Brady. Um, yeah. So next question is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I was a communications specialist at the church I was at. And yet so often it overlapped into the production world and, and how do we coexist inside of a ministry framework? And so, uh, on your YouTube channel, you cover everything from better church emails to church 
stage design trends and all of those things in between, where do you see that overlap happening, especially going forward into the future? How important is that overlap between communications and production? Well, for me, like everything starts with communication because communication is the verbal embodiment of your church's mission. And if you want as a church body to see your own leadership, but also the greater congregation, all be in tune with like what you're trying to accomplish, which you know, isn't just going through the motions every single week. If you want to achieve something greater as a church, like you really need to articulate that mission in a concise way. And so like, frankly, when I think about the content that we do, whether that be church stage design as a perfect example, I really do not have a passion for church stage design Wait, whatsoever. What? what? I, I, I have Brady. very, very little amount of care towards church stage design. But okay, what I do know noted. is that the search volume for that right. term is much higher than almost any other topic that I create content on. And so, you know, for years I've written videos, uh, blog posts, done podcasts on church stage design as, as a means to an end, essentially to like build the audience to then say, Hey, look, church stage design is fun. And it's a like fun, like creative project, but like, is it really affecting life change to the degree that we emphasize it? Yeah. And to mm-hmm. me, like as an, as someone who like has a very analytical mind, I'm always thinking about like return on investment or just like understanding that we as churches have such a finite amount of resources. And so it's imperative that again, we allocate those resources in the best way possible to be good stewards of what we have, because that would be certainly something I think we'd all agree is a good endeavor to pursue, but also just to like accomplish our mission as much as possible, because you don't have like, surely every one of our churches, no matter how big or small have only like, I, I'm at a church now of like a couple thousand and like, we still can't always get the cameras that we want as an example. I served at three consecutive church plants in a row in Bible college and as an intern. And then when I moved back here to Ontario, where I grew up, like we also never could afford the cameras we wanted. Like (laughs) it's something that just is a, a, a truism, no matter how big or small your church likely is like, there's always more that you wish you could do. So this is where, again, like it gets back to like, what is our mission as a church and what are the best ways to accomplish that? And so uh, to answer your question, that's a little bit of a, a roundabout way of getting there, but communications to me is first and foremost, because that's what gets your leadership on the same page to truly like get inspired and motivated to go after what's going to contribute the most to fulfillment of mission. And it's really easy to get like distracted by like church stage design and think like, okay, we're doing this new series. This new series is super important. We want the stage to reflect that. Or, Hey, it's been a while since we updated this. Like, what can we do here? Nothing wrong with that. But I mean, we have raw data on the search volume, like churches, we care about this more than we should. Like (laughs) we care about it dramatically more than we should. Wow. That's good. Speaking towards things, you know, if, if we'd say in the church industry or, you, you know, you have this audience that you speak to. And I, I, I know often um, we see the content from you about, hey, churches, stop doing this or churches, you know, if, if you're going to hear me say one thing, do this, this one thing. What would you say uh, is, 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 you know, one thing that you wish you could change about uh, the industry that you're trying to serve, if we call it, you know, that? Well, I'd start with changing human nature. This isn't uh, exclusive to churches. Mm -hmm. I think it's true of any entrenched industry. We see this in education. We see this in healthcare. We certainly see it in politics, which is just like, Hey, we've always done it this way. And it's going to take a lot of hard work to do it another way. Like as one super relevant example, timely example, I mentioned TikTok. Anytime a new social platform comes around, we will focus on all the reasons not to embrace that platform And we'll turn a blind eye to perhaps the same issues or same concerns of current platforms that we're on. Mm. That's human nature because something is new. We, by nature, are going to be less likely to engage with it because it's new, it's unfamiliar. When something's unfamiliar, we're just that much more likely to deem it as dangerous. Which, when when you think about it, it's like, oh, that's pretty like simple like that's a little juvenile but that's that's just how we exist it. it's yeah. just how we're how we're wired mm-hmm. so like so, so a person i was talking with them on twitter recently and they said um 
you know, I, I can't in good, in good sound logic or uh, as a sound mind, sound conscious, just go on TikTok because like, we know there are child predators there. Mm-hmm. And I said, you have a huge Instagram account. Like, and then I sent her a police report that was from this year in Michigan. And these Michigan police officers were like, yeah, Instagram is definitely the worst place we've <laughs> wow. found for child predators. Mm. And, and that, and I wasn't using it as like, this is a definitive proof that yeah. you're right or wrong, right. but more just to like illustrate the double standard that we use. Like we are not applying our conscious consistently. Yeah. So then to use the conviction, like Trump card to say, I will not do this out of conviction. It's like, mm-hmm. well, you're not applying that consistently. So let's not call that conviction. Let's just call that. You're familiar with something. You're used to it. You're afraid of this new thing. That's okay. But let's just call it that. Cause once we can expose that for what it is, then we can approach it with a more sound mind and start evaluating something based on its merits rather than our own familiarity. And yeah. when we do this in everything in church, like we're familiar with this for years, we saw this with mailed printouts versus social media advertising. Mm-hmm. So I could go to a church and I could say, we know you can spend 10 X less on social advertising meet, uh, reach 10 times more people and it'll be 10 times more effective. Now let's not do what that. do you want to do? No. Well, we've used the local mail printout agency for years. So we're going to say, uh, we're going to spend 10 K and send, you know, 2,500 mailers to our neighborhoods. Like, well, has that worked in the past? No, but it's what we do every Easter. It's yeah. like, okay, this is a frustrating conversation for me at this point. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you, you just seem so calm right now. I mean, it's just like... <laughs> You're, le- you're, you're giving me these leading questions like, Brady, if you could change one uh, thing. You know what? I, and I, they- I, that's one of the things I love most about just when I, when I get to see the, the, the Twitter conversations or whatever. I know when I, I see a Brady Shear Instagram story and it's like a screenshot of somebody's response to you. It's like, yeah, they're, uh, you know, it's, it's usually something that's uh, a, a bit of a reactionary, uh, um, you know, misunderstanding or something that. Well, um, I think what's cool is it's just proof again of like how much you care and yeah. where you've came from mm-hmm. and how like deep seated that passion is to help the church and to see, uh, the church use, uh, mediums that are readily available right. to, to spread the message of Jesus. So definitely so, so cool. Well, and, and just to, just, just, you know, just to justify myself a tiny bit more, like, oh, please, please. one of the things I noticed when I started creating content in the church world, like I dipped my toe in, in like, you know, 10 years ago, it's like, it felt like we would have a lot of conversations where, where people didn't really say what they thought. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you, you sound polite. And it, and it sounds like you're like agreeing with me, but I can tell you don't, right. it's like, this isn't going to lead to progress. Mm-hmm. Like, I think there's a book right now. I have not read this book, but I've seen a lot of people talk about called radical candor. And I think the idea behind the book, as I saw summarized by someone was like, say something with great care for the other person, but also like say what you truly feel. Right. And it's like, there's that one person we all know that's like, listen, I just say it how it is, but like, you're a jerk when you do it. (laughs) And we don't want that. But we also don't want the overly polite person that never says what they truly feel right. and are like usually just very bubbly about it mm-hmm. because that's just just as bad, maybe even worse because yeah. there's a deceptive element to it. Sure. If we can say these things plainly backed by data, ideally, mm-hmm. but we can say them with great care for the other person and with empathy, recognizing that like, look, I understand that the average lead pastor in the evangelical world is like upper fifties, early sixties. I cannot empathize with how, or I cannot sympathize because I I don't know, but I can empathize with how difficult it must be to do ministry for your entire life in one way, be on the cusp of like passing it off to the next generation and then seeing like the entire landscape of culture change in what must have felt like overnight. Right. Like, that's not easy. Like this paradigm shift is not going to be something that feels good or is accessible to most of us. Like in the first year, it's a massive change. We're turning like a cruise ship around. You can't be as agile as like a 180 turn overnight because you might just like crack the ship open and everyone will, you know, drown with it. And so I have empathy for that, but I think we also just need to drop like the fake plastic exterior and sure. pretending not to really talk about what matters. Right. Sure. Yeah. Actually that brings up a good question. I think it's a good question. You might think it's horrible. Uh, a lot of times what happens in, in the tech world, uh, especially in churches, uh, you know, the production side of things kind of sees the writing on the wall and they say, 
man, we got to change something. We got to do something different. We need to implement this piece of equipment or strategy or medium or platform in order to like expand our reach. And then they are met with the, you know, 50 year old pastor that's been doing ministry the same way or the leadership team that's averse to change and afraid of new. Do you have any advice uh, to someone in the production world trying to lead change while not in a leadership position? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the framework I'm about to share, I got from a lead pastor. I can't take credit for it. I basically went to a lead pastor and was like, okay, someone wants to affect change as like a person that is employed by you. How do they go about doing it? And so this was the framework they gave me. So the first thing you want to do is you need to anchor what you're asking for to the mission of the church. Because if you are the lead pastor, you have this vision for what you want to accomplish. And and, and ideally that vision has been well articulated with the rest of leadership. So everyone's understanding, here's the direction that we're going. So if you want to see change within your own organization, within your church, you go to the lead pastor and say, look, I know that this is the vision for our church. I know this is the direction where we're going. I have an idea on how to fulfill this mission. And you basically want to use their words, like exactly how they say it to like demonstrate that this isn't about you. And it's not even about them, the lead pastor. It's about the organization. It's about the church and like the mission that we're all on together. And then you can even say like, I have a way to achieve it. That's like not going to cost a lot of money and might even like be achieving it more uh, quickly than in ways that we're doing currently. Then you explain the idea that you have. If there's a cost element, one practical thing that you can do is like lay out three different pricing ways of doing it. There's the cheap way, there's the medium way, there's the expensive way. The lead pastor told me, he's like, the key here is like, the expensive way is not what you could ever realistically do. And also it's not what you want. Put the one that you want as the middle one. (laughs) And this is like classic philosophical price anchoring. He's like, put the what you want as the middle one. This person wasn't always a lead pastor. I guess they used this and it was effective (laughs) when they were. uh, They were in sales first. (laughs) Yeah, the one you want is the middle one. The expensive one is like what maybe the lead pastor perceives as the one you want, but is like so far out of the budget is like not realistic whatsoever. You know, the medium one is exactly what you need and good enough. And then the low one you have to put in such a way where you're like, we could go this way, but we may as well not even attempt this if we go this way, because we just won't have what we need to do it. Uh, And then what you want to do is basically prove that your thesis was correct because so much of affecting change when you're not in charge is equity with the people that are in charge. Mm -hmm. When I first started as a media director, like I spent every night that I could learning how to do that one simple tilt shift effect, because I know that my pastor was inspired by that video because he's the one that shared it with me. He's like, well, this is a really cool vision video. Your first big project is to do a vision video for our church plan. I knew he was inspired by that. And so I was like, okay, I want to prove to him that like him hiring me as this media director, like was not a poor decision. And I want to like go past his own expectations for me and like prove that I can do this. Sure. And then once that I did that and like, blew him away with the video that I had made, I had a little bit more equity the next time that I asked him for something. And so this is also where understanding like your place in the church and how long you've been there is important. Mm -hmm. You don't want to come in and within the first year, try to do a ton of things. You might not want to even do that in the first two years. If you have not been at your church for more than a couple of years, like you probably want to table this and wait Mm -hmm. uh, until you've like built up a bit more of that equity with your leadership. Because once you have that equity, that really is like the prerequisite needed to even attempt this process. Uh, Otherwise you might come off as like that hotshot, that new guy that's like, everything's broken at this church. And I know you've been (laughs) serving this uh, local congregation for years, but what you don't understand is that you're doing it all wrong. And then you come in with that attitude and it's, it's, it's likely not going to go well. I don't, I wouldn't expect. I, I don't know. Oh, yeah. there might be a chance there could be a, no not at all um, and I, I love that I, I think that's just a great reminder though too that you know it's like so much of we do, what we do especially when it's wrapped up into something like church where it is so personal it it, it becomes so much of something that's tied into our identity yeah. and tie, it's you know we take it as an insult on ourselves when somebody says no and they probably feel the same when you're you know trying to change or affect change in the way that they do ministry so just respecting sure. that balance and understanding I think is really great yeah 
No, absolutely. I think that's where that empathy piece comes in as well. Prior to going into those kinds of meetings, Brady, I'm sure you probably agree is like, try to put yourself in their shoes so that you come in uh, understanding where maybe they're at. And so maybe you can help kind of bridge that gap um, between what you're asking for and what they feel like they can offer. And it's also okay to just know, like, you're not going to accomplish everything you want in one conversation. Yeah, sure. You know, this isn't like, okay, we're going to sit down, we're going to do our 30 minute meeting over zoom or in person. And like, we are going to, I'm going to get what I want. Like, that's not an expectation that's probably reasonable to hold. You've got to think about this as like, okay, uh, maybe I might need to prove that this can be done with zero budget with zero time given. Yeah. Like maybe I have these responsibilities and I need to go above and beyond. And, and we have to be careful with this in church, you know, because like often we as individuals are stretched way too thin. And so I'm not advocating that you do something that would be like harmful to your own soul or spirit uh, because you're already doing too much. But if you don't have that equity, let's say, and you want to fast track it, the way to do that is to like go above and beyond and prove that like, Hey, what I'm saying, like, I know what I'm talking about in this respect, because look, maybe this lead pastor, they, they've been burned in the past and they might be a bit of a micromanager more than you would prefer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and they're making calls on creative things that you're like in your head. I don't, I, you do not have the expertise to make this call. Like, why are you asking me to change the font? Like, no, the yeah. kerning on this font is, is atrocious. Like <laughs> I know you saw it on another church's thing, but like it was bad for them. It's just as bad for us. Like, just cause they use comic do... sans doesn't mean we need to use comic sans. <laughs> Right. And it's like, let me do what I need to do. Well, maybe they've been burned in the past. Right. And so like, again, so much of this, uh, like nature said, it's like, it's dealing with people. And, uh, and, and, and that's why I, I don't do it. I don't have that relational bandwidth. You know, I just make YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. All right. Uh, so we were talking about, you know, people in production, people in communications, having too much on their plate, wearing multiple hats. What would you talk, uh, what would you say to a tech director on the verge of burnout? Yeah. Or even communications person for that matter. Anybody who's involved yeah. in the church. Yeah. Someone yeah. in ministry they're mm -hmm. they've taken on way too much. They're being asked to wear multiple hats. They're up late at night. They're rarely home, all this different stuff. We know what happens in the church. And, and a lot of times it can be cloaked in like, I'm doing this for Jesus. And, you know, and so often we see that lead to burnout. Um, you know, you're sitting across from someone at, a you know, Starbucks or whatever. I don't know if we can do that anymore, but <laughs> what do you say to them to help, help course correct? So the question I always ask myself internally, and I really can only say this from personal experience because I, I can speak pretty authoritatively on a lot of things that have to do with social and digital and platforms that have been around for 10 years because I've been doing them for 10 years. So like I've been doing them as long as you can basically be doing them. I'm 29 though. So to say like I could be speaking authoritatively on, on burnout and like work-life balance, like that's not true. So I, I'll just say from personal experience, the question I ask myself and my friends is like, how's your soul? And usually for me, at least it's got less to do with my workload and more to do with like how I'm taking care of myself in all the other areas of life. Hmm. So maybe I'm more sensitive to this than others, but like my diet needs to be precise for me to work my best. My exercise routine needs to be precise. My sleep needs to be precise. I have this spreadsheet and this is where I'm going to show how crazy of a human that I am. <laughs> I have this spreadsheet called habits of joy. I've been tracking it for about eight months. And, you know, maybe this is like a third life crisis. I'm about to turn 30. It's coincided with a global pandemic. I got blood work done. Apparently I have all these food sensitivities. I've got yeah. chronic back pain. Now my dermatologist put me on a second round of Accutane. Like it's hard enough to turn 30. All these things are happening <laughs> no. at once. It's a lot. So I created this uh, spreadsheet called habits of joy. And it's like the 10 things that I track where I know, like, if I do these things every day, I know that my soul, my spirit and my physical body will be at their best to do the work that I am entrusted to do in this world. And so that involves uh, prayer. It involves stretching. It involves a gallon of water a day, a 10 minute walk, vitamins, eight hours or more of sleep. I have an AM PM, uh, PM hygiene routine that has to do with like, you know, flossing, brushing, face, skincare, all that uh, exercises on there as well. 
I always go back to there first when I'm evaluating how I'm feeling. If I'm stretched in at work, rarely does that not coincide with these habits slipping. Hmm, yeah. When I can serve and give and create out of abundance, I, I rarely get to a place where I'm burnt out. Uh, that all it does not the perfect solution for everything beyond that. I love saying no to things. And that's a little bit of like privilege that I have of being like in charge, but like being on this podcast, like it's the second one I've been on this year. I've only said yes to two. I knew Rezzy. I was like, I like those people. I'll say yes to them. Uh, the other one that I was got asked, I was like, I know that person. I'll say yes to them. I get a lot of cold requests for podcasts and I have had seasons where I've said yes to every single one of them. Uh, this season, my team and I were like, sorry, we're just not doing that right now because I just don't know if I'm like feeling really up to that yeah. because it's been 18 months of a pandemic and mm -hmm. I just want to say no to more things right now. And so, sure. you know, it's also just important to say no to things. You won't always be able to say no to everything, but you will be able to say no to some things and I'm pretty aggressive with, with saying no as, you know, it changes by season, but those, those are two things that come to mind at least. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. And I think a lot of people need to hear that. So mm -hmm. thanks for sharing. Yeah. If there's anything else that you would share, you know, obviously, um, you know, we, we thought, like we talked about earlier, uh, there's, there's these two different worlds that we kind of live in between production and communication and you handle both and there's a crossover there. Um, what if there's anything that we're not asking you that you would share with our audience? Um, what would you say? Well, I think that these skills that we're talking about, these verticals that we live in, it's not something that you like go to school for or you like complete a digital course in and like you've learned it. They're constantly evolving disciplines. They're evolving because like by nature, they're creative. And thus there's really no like, Oh, I learned this, which would be true for cinematography. That's, you know, a discipline that's been around for hundreds of years, maybe not, maybe like 85 years on it, but it's also true because we're at the very beginning of these things existing in a lot of yeah. ways. Like social didn't exist prior to 2007 when Facebook opened publicly, let's say save for MySpace, Friendster. So like you can't learn those things and then like, Hey, I learned it. Like you can't learn Instagram and then be like, I'm done with Instagram. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that like, if you feel challenged by these things, if you feel like they're daunting, they're intimidating. I feel that way too. Because like, as soon as I've understood something like the day I released a course on Snapchat was the day Instagram, the day I got an email from Instagram in 2015 that said, we've released Instagram stories. And I was like, why Lord, why would you do this to me? <laughs> like, I just, I just did this and I got to do it all over again. That is really just the life of someone that's serving in the digital world. And so the reason we have a YouTube channel, the reason we have our podcast, the reason we create all of our content is because we're all on this journey together. And the reason we're always doing more content is like the best thing that you can do to learn these things is to go to YouTube university, type in Brady Shear or pro church tool, subscribe to me, subscribe to church front, subscribe to, you know, the Resi channel and just watch the videos and learn. It might be hard to believe this, but prior to 2020, I had never really ever taken a photo on a camera. Like I truly had never taken a photo. I had known I, I did video. That's what I did. I knew everything about video, but for some reason I just had never gotten into photography. And so when the pandemic first hit, I had a little bit more free time and I was like, you know what? I'm going to learn photography this year. And it was like a creative pursuit that I figured out. And I had a lot of pre-existing knowledge from video that crossed over. And I was like, oh, choosing my shutter speed wasn't actually as hard as I thought. Like, huh, I could have learned this a lot easier, a, a lot <laughs> earlier. But even for me, like I'm always learning new things. I'm always trying to like figure out what are the latest little tweaks. Like all these platforms have their own languages, have their own unique cultures that are slightly different. And the really only way to become good at them, to take that timeless message of Christ and share it through timely mediums is to be like an active practitioner on these platforms. It's just watching, paying attention, making notes, and then truly publishing. Like you got to publish something. It's got to go well. It's got to go poorly. You've got to learn from that, get the feedback, reverse engineer, what did well, what did poorly and do it again. And uh, whether you've been at it for 10 years, 
you've been at it for 17 years. You're Mark Zuckerberg. You literally invented it. Like it's always changing and there's really no authoritative expert on it. There are just people that have been doing it longer. And most importantly, there are people that are doing it right now. And you can be one of those people too. And if you are, you will be of great service to the global church. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Brady. That's all the time we have. And I, I'll just say for me, this has been incredibly valuable time. Thank you so much for sharing from your experience and sharing what you're up to at Pro Church Tools. And uh, yeah, we look forward to speaking with you again. Yeah, thanks, man. Likewise. Thanks again for uh, the invitation. I had a great time. Absolutely. And how cool was that? <laughs> wow. Uh, mind is blown right now. <laughs> it's just so cool to hear. I mean, he's just like dripping with mm-hmm. passion for what he's trying to accomplish. Yeah. And, and serve really the local church and the mm-hmm. global church. It's unbelievable. I think there's there's a lot to be said too about just coming back to the why and coming back to, hey, um, everybody it, it feels passionate about the way that they do things. And especially in the area of ministry, when people are at stake and you're affecting people and affecting people's lives, um, it can get it can get personal in, in, in a lot of ways. And so um, being able to handle that um, with respect and, and confidence and, um, and care is, is really important. And I think that's a, that's a good, good thing to hit on. Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing I'll take away from this for sure is that empathy piece. Yeah. And, you know, whether you're talking about uh, approaching senior leadership about something you want, you know, to affect uh, change in uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to like how you're reaching people or even thinking about uh, Gen Z and right. like empathizing with them in a way of like, okay, how are they actually going to experience church in a way that makes sense to them Yeah. Uh, versus, you know, kind of like, we're just going to keep doing church the same way <laughs> right. and they're going to like it. Right. And uh, I just feel like, you know, Brady has done such a great job of kind of like straddling those, you know, two different things of confidence yeah. and empathy at the same time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I, I think that's really valuable for, for our audience to hear, especially mostly probably being in production. Um, and especially with those long hours and, you know, uh, the, the burnout piece of checking yourself, checking your, your own habits first, realizing that, um, you know, after, after a Christmas, uh, or after, you know, an 80 hour week because of whatever event that's going on, um, you can get a little, uh, a little crispy sometimes. Yeah, uh, and, absolutely. uh, and it's, it can be reflected and it, it can be, uh, sometimes you accidentally take that out on, on, you know, members of your team, no, absolutely. whether that's volunteers yeah. or whether that's, um, upper leadership or anything like that. And maybe, uh, maybe waiting until after that week is over to I mean, address some of those things. Not that, good, but. not that anyone's ever felt burnt out after, you no. know, Christmas or Easter. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've never experienced that. Yeah. Ever, but so. again, that reminder too, that, um, y- you've got to check your own habits first. No, absolutely. Um, and those external factors, your, your work, uh, is obviously going to affect that, but also just think about how, how are you, um, with your own personal habits and how are you with your own spiritual, um, you know, habits and your own physical habits and everything else. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. That is all the time we have. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for listening. And most of all, thanks for being you. You guys are the ones that are out there gutting it out at every production, giving it your best. And we just hope that in some small way, this show uh, helps you feel seen and loved and appreciated for the work you guys are doing out there. Uh, I think that's it for us. Yeah. Right. That's it. All right. See you on the next one. See ya. Thank you.